This is Chris. I hope you're doing well and welcome to Popcorn Finance, the show where we discuss finance and about the time it takes to make a bag of popcorn. I appreciate you all coming and joining me here when there's so much going on. And I just want to say thank you for, for trusting me to continue to guide you all along in your financial journey. And I know a lot of you are still looking for ways to help with this fight against injustice in our country to help fight for equality and for the statement that Black Lives Matter. And I know it feels crazy to have to fight to say that Black Lives Matter in 2020, but sadly, that is still the state that our country is in. And for me, I I believe that there are two things that you can do to do help and be uh, an ally and uh, a force for justice in this country. And one of the things you can do is to make change with your dollars if you are in a financial position to do so. And I want to stress that uh, most importantly, is that I know not all of us are in a position where we can help financially, but if you're looking for ways to help and you can help financially, um, I want to talk about an organization that I think uh, is really important in this fight for equality and change in our country. And I wanted to talk about this organization because I believe now, you know, more than ever, voting is extremely important, but voting is not always easy for everyone. Historically in our country, black and Latino men and women have faced discrimination at the voting polls. And so that's why today I want to talk about an organization called Fair Fight Action, and they can be found at fairfight.com. And this isn't sponsored. You know, I don't, I don't know the people who run this organization. They're not paying me anything to say this, but I just thought that this was an organization that'd be worth checking out. I'm not sure if you caught the news stories that were going around last week, but in Georgia, there was a lot of issues centered around their primary elections that were going on. And it was pretty bad. I mean, to say the least, there there were issues with machines being down, with long lines, I mean, hours and hours uh, worth of lines and inadequate training and equipment and support for the election process in predominantly black neighborhoods. And one of the things that Fair Fight focuses on is providing education and support for these communities that are disproportionately affected when it comes to issues are centered around voting. So they are all about educating, providing resources and training for these sites and to be an advocate for the people who don't have a voice when it comes time to vote. So if you're looking for a cause to support right now, and I know there are a ton of very worthy organizations out there who could use your help, and I'll try my best to uh, find those organizations and give them a shout out here on the show. But I believe that Fair Fight is one of those organizations is worth checking out if you have a little bit of time. And one thing I really want to stress is that when I'm talking about the importance of voting and getting out there and making your voice be heard, I'm not specifically talking about voting for a particular party. I don't mean you should go vote for a Democrat over a Republican. I'm not saying any of that. I think the importance of voting is to make your voice heard and to cast your vote for someone who reflects the values and changes that you hope to see in this country. And so taking the time, getting out there, voting, and also helping those who have difficulty when it comes to vote is extremely important. So definitely recommend you start putting that on your radar, getting ready for the elections that will be coming up later this year. And the second thing that I believe you can do to help out with everything that's going on is to continue to take care of and improve your finances because it is so hard to try to help others in their fight when when you're struggling and when you have the burden of debt and uh, uncertainty in your financial lives, which I, I've been there and I, I know it's just that, that consumes your whole life, your, all your thoughts. And so the best thing you can do to be an advocate and to be helpful and supportive is to also take care of yourself. So today I wanted to talk about investing. And if you've seen any news about the stock market recently, or really throughout 2020, you've seen that it's been moving wildly up and down with everything that's going on. And so when you see these situations where the stock market is all over the place, often it can be tempting to hop in and say, hey, I'm going to buy a few shares of this stock. I'm going to throw $100 here, $500 here and try to make a big gamble and, and, and really come out ahead when all this stuff clears up. But that can be very risky, especially if you have not put in the time or the research, which a lot of us don't have the time to do uh, in order to make very informed decisions. And so today we're going to have a conversation about investing versus trading. And to help me in this conversation, I am joined by Caleb Silver once again, the the editor and chief of investopedia.com, one of my favorite financial resource websites. Today, Caleb is going to help us understand the difference between investing and trading. I think this really comes into play right now where we're, you have people who are you know, thinking kind of short term and maybe I'll jump in the market, make a profit, hop out. And to me, what comes to mind is like the difference between investing versus trading. 
and what that really means and how different those two approaches are to getting into the stock market? It's a great question. Traders typically are not long-term investors. They don't hold positions. They don't hold stocks, sometimes even more than a day, sometimes even more than an hour. They're trading in and out of stocks looking for price imbalance. They're trying to buy low and sell high, or they're trying to, if they bought something high, maybe they're shorting it and trying to sell it low. So they're trying to time stock price movement that has nothing to do with the fundamentals of a company or the economy at large. They're just in and out trading uh, without thinking about what they want to do long term. They will get out of their positions at the end of the day. And it's a very risky way to make money. Some people have been able to do it and have their own processes for doing it. But for people who are just getting into the world of, of stock investing or the markets in general, that's extremely dangerous. And I completely dissuade you from doing that. Investing is the process of putting money away for the future, investing in something that should deliver returns over the long term, and then watching those returns compound. And what do I mean when we say compound? Well, let's say the stock market on average goes up 10% a year a little higher than it normally does, but let's just say it's 10%. If you put a thousand bucks in and you get a 10% return, you now have $1,100 at the end of the year. If you put another hundred bucks in and the stock market goes up 10%, now you're compounding your returns and you're growing your wealth by what we call the rule of 72. Okay, let's take a quick pause right here because Caleb mentioned a very interesting term and that is the rule of 72. And I'm sure many of you are not familiar with that term. So I wanted to take a moment to break that down for you and to help me explain what the rule of 72 is. I wanted to share a quick chat that I had with Lauren Silbert, the VP and general manager of TheBalance.com, who did an excellent job of breaking down what the rule of 72 is. I'm going to preface it by saying, don't try to make sense of why the number 72 is in it, um, unless you <laughs> want to go through a very complex set of math. Um, but this is a really simple rule that lets you calculate the estimate of how long it's going to take to double your money for any given rate of return. So all you want to do is take the number 72 divided by what you, you think your ROI is or what the rate, the, you know, the interest that you're going to gain on that investment is. And it'll tell you the number of years that it's going to take you to double that investment. Got it. Okay. So could you give us like an example of how someone would um, figure out how this would fit into what? Yeah, exactly. So let's say I'm going to use a very aggressive and very lovely interest rate just to make things easier. But I don't know (laughs) if this is really applicable to any real things just yet. But, you know, let's say your money is in a high yield savings account earning 3% a year. It's going to take 24 years to double your money because the calculation you're going to do is 72 divided by three, and that equals 24. So you should know that if you're putting that money in, let's say you're just putting $100 to make it easy for everyone to understand, in 24 years, you're going to have $200, which doesn't sound that exciting. But hopefully you're not only investing $100 in something. But that's a really good way for you to think about how it's going to work. Thanks, Lauren, for that explanation. I hope that little breakdown there made that term a little more clear for you. And let's hop back into my conversation with Caleb. That's what investing is. That's long-term investing, planning on keeping those investments or being invested for three, five, 10, 20 years. And that's a great way to build wealth over time, but it's very different than trading, which is a risk play, trying to find price imbalance within stocks, making a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars over the course of a day or a week, getting out. Mm, okay. Yeah. So that, I mean, that is a completely different approach. And one specifically talking about the, the trading side sounds very stressful to me, at least, <laughs> and how it would go about uh, doing those two different things. It's very stressful and it's not for the, it's not for the weak of heart and nobody should try it if they only have a thousand dollars in their savings account and they're trying to grow their money fast. It's like going to the roulette wheel, uh, but even riskier because you really have no control over price movement. You can have, you can set processes to make sure that your risks uh, you have your risk allocated in the right places, but most traders lose money. And anybody that thinks that they can beat the market usually doesn't. Very few people are able to make some money and, and have a good process where they keep it very modest, but it's not a place to try to grow money long term. It's a great place to lose money very quickly, and then you will not have that money that you may need for an emergency. So we dissuade people from doing that. But if you have some extra cash and you want to do it on the side, by all means, do it, but just know that you know, your your likelihood of losing is much greater than your likelihood of winning. Mm-hmm. 
Now, after hearing our conversation, I hope your takeaway is not that you shouldn't be investing in the stock market because that is the exact opposite of what Caleb is saying. What he's doing is he's warning you against taking big risks instead of investing for the long run, because if you're investing for retirement, this is years, decades out into the future. And so you don't want to deal with the stress and potentially losing large chunks of money that you would want to have for the future by jumping into the stock market and kind of just playing it by ear. And right now, a lot of investment apps are out there that make this very easy. It makes it very tempting to go out there and try to pick the next big winner or find that company that's you know went bankrupt and they're going to come back and you're going to make all this money. You know, there's, there's so many stories out there. There's so much temptation. But I just want to say that steady, consistent investment in your 401k at work, in your IRA, is one, less stressful, and two, uh, a less risky way of prepping for this long-term investment goal of retirement. Because, and I can't stress this enough, there is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with being a boring investor. That's the type of investor I want to be. I don't want to have to think and worry about what's going on in my retirement account and my investment account at any given time. I want to be able to sleep easy knowing that this is a long game and I'm putting in money consistently over time and I will be able to retire when that time comes. So thank you all for listening. And again, I want to give a big thank you to Caleb Silver from Investopedia.com and Lauren Silbert from TheBalance.com. These are two great resources. If you ever have questions or you want to look up a term or, or something you've heard quickly, great sites where I think I pretty much found any answer that I'm looking for on either of those two sites. So again, two great resources, uh, investopedia.com and thebalance.com. And if you ever want to reach out to me, the best way to do that is over on Instagram. You can find me at popcorn finance podcast. And if you ever have a question or you just want to say hi, just send me a message. It's always great to hear from y'all who are taking time to listen to the show, or you can reach me by calling or texting 707-200-8259. As always, I appreciate you all joining me here for another bag of popcorn. I hope you all have an amazing and safe rest of your week, and I'll talk to you soon. Your boy, keep it popping like Mary Poppins.